Amen. But we're not there yet. Amen. Amen. We're almost home, but we still got work to do here. Right. Yeah. And it's good to see people getting baptized. Sister Amen. Kim said when she walked up there, that water is hot. I'm not joking. It's like 500 degrees up here. Pardon me. Matthew chapter 4 tonight. Next week, we're having Brother Rogers in, and we're praying to have revival. Yeah. Amen. It's a revival meeting. We want to have a revival. We can have a revival this week, though, but what do we need in order to have a revival? Jesus Christ gives us a pretty clear outline, and he, um, I lost my sermon. One second. Matthew chapter 4. He gave us something pretty clear that we need, that we can do to have an out, to have a, um, Revival, but what is it that we need in our lives to have a revival? Is it the biggest, best evangelist? Brother Rogers, he can sing, but he's not going to be the one that brings it. Is it going to be having everybody in town come in? What is it that we need to have revival this week, next week, an ongoing revival? We hear about the Great Awakenings back in 1800s, I think. We hear about those, and we'd love to see that again, but what do we need in order to have a revival this week? Matthew chapter 4, familiar passage, but many times we try to think of better ways to share the gospel. What if we got everyone on social media to see it? What if we got the whole town in? What if we could feed everyone in the world, get everyone in? How can we get everyone to hear the gospel? What can BBC do to reach Lancaster? We have our tracks all over town. We share the gospel with those around us, but what is something we can do to impact the whole city at once? People ask these questions all the time. What can we do to reach the whole community? And Jesus here in the book of Matthew is just starting his earthly ministry. Chapters 1, he's born. Chapter 2, we see some of his childhood. It skips 33 years. And Jesus begins his earthly ministry. He goes to John the Baptist. He hears John preaching. John the Baptist is his cousin. John's preaching, and he says, the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. He tells the Pharisees they need to repent. And he's baptizing them the, baptize, the baptism of repentance. And Jesus goes to John to get baptized. He set the example, once we get saved, we need to get baptized. Now, Jesus already was the Son of God, obviously. He did not need to be saved, but he set that example. Right. And that's why we have baptism here in church. It doesn't save us, but it shows that we have been saved. It shows that we are a child of God. Amen. Chapter 4, but Jesus, we come to chapter 4, it's chapter 3, and we come to chapter 4, and it says, chapter 4, verse 1, Matthew 4, verse 1 says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. But when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, as we come in your presence tonight, Lord, thank you so much for your blessings tonight, Lord. Just visitors tonight, Lord, thank you for each of them being here. Visitors this morning, thank you for that, Lord. Thank you just for the baptisms tonight, Lord. And if anyone here is saved and they haven't been baptized, Lord, it's an identification of them following you. It's an outward showing that they've been saved on the inside. And thank you for that, Lord. I pray if someone is saved and not baptized, that they would be baptized, Lord. And those here tonight may have never placed their faith in your son's finished works, Lord. When your son died on the cross, was buried, and rose again, he said, it is finished, Lord. If they have never placed their faith in your finished works, Lord, we don't want them to spend an eternity in the lake of fire, Lord. We pray they place their faith in you, Lord. And Lord, tonight as we get ready to look forward to next week, Lord, we're excited to have Brother Rogers come, him and Miss Liz. We're excited for the fellowship, the singing, the preaching, Lord. Amen. But we really want you to do a work in our hearts, Lord. And we know you will if we'll follow you, Lord. We pray you just work as you see fit tonight. Throughout the week, next week, keep the Rogers safe as they come in, Lord. But tonight, speak to each and every one of us. And if one's not saved, we pray to you, Lord. This is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The title of my message tonight is Three Really Good Things That Won't Bring a Revival. Three Really Good Things That Won't Bring a Revival. Jesus gives, or Satan gives Jesus three temptations here. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It is impossible that he would sin. But 
that had to be proven. It says he was tempted, Hebrews says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. This is that passage. Jesus was tempted to the spirit or the lust of the flesh. He's tempted by the lust of the eyes. He's tempted by the pride of life. John says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh is what we want, what our flesh wants, the lust of the eyes, when something looks good and we want to take it. In the pride of life, trying to lift ourselves up. Jesus was tempted in these three ways. We're going to look at it from a different angle tonight. We know he knew no sin. We know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was virgin born, born of the Virgin Mary, but he was born of the Holy Spirit of God. He is the Son of God, and he could not sin. And we use this passage a lot to teach how to get through temptation without falling, without falling into temptation. But tonight I want to look at it in a different way. I want to look at three things that will not bring revival. Three really good things that will bring revival. We start off in verse 1. It says, Jesus was already baptized. In verse 1 it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He says, Command these stones that they be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Satan's offer, he said, Make these stones bread. Jesus had just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I'll tell you what, if I go 40 minutes without eating, we'll start. If I go 40 days and 40 nights without eating, I'm going to die. There ain't no way. I know my cousin was telling me there was a guy in his church that was trying to do this, and he was fasting, and he went 25 days. He only ate crackers, drank water, and drank soda. And they're like, if that soda is the one thing you're going to allow in your system, that's, that's not a good way to do this. He said the guy looks horrible. But that's besides the point. Jesus had just fasted 40 days and 40 nights, spending time with his Father in prayer. He's denying his flesh, spending time with his Heavenly Father. He just been baptized. And by the way, when you get baptized, when you start serving God and you get serious about serving God, Satan's always going to come. Tempted to Satan's going to try to shut everything down that you're doing. But he comes to Jesus Christ and he says, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, there's nothing wrong. If we could get all the stones in Lancaster and turn them into bread, we could feed the whole world. We could get a whole lot done. We could have a food line. We could ship the food everywhere else in the world that needs it. We could get so much done if we could turn all the stones into bread. But Jesus says, "Man shall not." It is written, "Man shall not live by bread alone, right. but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God." Christ is quoting Deuteronomy eight verse three. It says, "And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna." Which thou knewest not, God had brought the manna, that bread. He brought it to the Israelites. He fed them miraculously. He says, He fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, and neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You see, all through the Bible, people that didn't have the food they need, but God provided for them miraculously. We saw Elijah, he had just been on Mount Carmel. Or right before, he was right before, right after Mount Carmel. But Elijah, God's prophet, he goes in, into the wilderness, and God gives him water through this brook, and he has the ravens come and feed Elijah every day. He runs out of food, and he goes to this widow woman, and he says, can you make me, God said to this widow woman, he says, can you make me a cake, make me some bread, something I can eat? And she says, I have enough for me and my son. We owe people money. We're going to eat this, and we're going to die. And he says, give it to me, and the barrel will never run full. That is something that would take a whole lot of faith. But man shall not live by bread alone. She provided for God's man. She took care of the, of the prophet. And when she gave to God's work first, then God blessed the barrel never ran empty. They always Amen. had food because they took God seriously. Satan said, command that these stones be made bread. Jesus hasn't eaten in 40 days or 40 minutes. You know, if you want to turn to John chapter 6, turn to John chapter 6. The answer to reaching the world is not simply giving them bread. We have a lot of even good organizations in town, food banks, food drives, all these things that get food to people that need it. But if we don't get them the gospel, it's not going to help our city in. Right. It's not going to help them at all. I heard someone say the other day, if the prodigal son had had a food bank in the, or he had a food drive or something, if he had had a way to get food in the far country, he probably would have never came home. You know, sometimes we may need to go without to get closer to God. But in John chapter 6, we see... It says in verse 1, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, 
which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were deceased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? You see, there's a bread problem. He says, Philip, look at this multitude. How are we going to feed each and every one of these? Read down to verse 6. He says, And this he said to prove him. Jesus is just testing Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, The two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. He says, You know, we don't even have enough money. There was a bread problem. There was a budget proposed. We said, he said, we have these 200 penny worth, but that's not enough to feed everybody. So they can't go looking for food. They can't afford the food. But one of his disciples, verse 8, says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. That boy was presented. Jesus says, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they needed. And when they were filled, he said unto them, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Jesus, this boy comes, they don't have enough money to pay for everything, but they bring this boy to him, and he just breaks up his lunch, and Jesus was able to provide for their needs. Amen. If we will look to Jesus, he'll provide our needs. Amen. If we can reach them, we can reach our, the world, we can reach those around us, whatever problems they have, Jesus can in his time and in his will, in his way, take care of that problem. Right. There is a bounty provided. So lending a hand is something that we should do. Jesus did it here, right? I'm not saying if we go out and help feed people, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying that can't be our main focus. Right. Jesus said, for whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. If we see someone on the road, they don't have any food. Not someone sitting on a corner with a sign next to them that says, don't give this person money. And they have like four cans of Mountain Dew and Red Bull and they have a nice chair and a nice coat. But if we see someone honestly in need and we don't give them food, that's a problem. That goes back on us. But giving people food is not going to bring revival to us. God promised to meet the needs of all his children. But the mission of the church is not to give bread, but give to the bread of life. John chapter 6, yeah. down to verse 51. Verse 51 says, Jesus says, I am the living bread. Notice we have a red letter Bible. That's red letters right there. It's Jesus speaking. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of his bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus Christ says, I am the bread of life. They had just had this big bread problem. Jesus goes on preaching. And we see here when he says, I am the bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. We keep reading in verse 52. It says, The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever, whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Turn back to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus says, I am the bread. Now, Jesus, obviously, he's not saying that we need to eat his physical body. But that salvation that he offered up on the cross, Jesus went to the cross, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. When Jesus gave his life on that, if we don't partake of that salvation, we will never get to heaven. We need, if we see someone in need, we need to get them bread. We need to help feed them. We need to provide for the physical needs of people. But providing for the physical needs of people is never enough to get a revival in our land. It's never enough to save our city. It's giving them eternal life. Now, if we try to give them eternal life and don't help them physically when we're able to, that's a problem. But if we can help them with the intention of and not waiting three years, but we help them and we give them a track and talk to them about Christ, give them the bread of life, that is what will start changing our town. He says, giving them their physical needs, that's not the focus. It's a good thing. But if we provide for everyone in town physically, it's not going to send us a revival. We need to give them the bread of life. As Satan goes on, he says, Then the devil taketh him up into the mountain, the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, like a high point, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, 
Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So Satan proposes another idea here. We're not going to make the stones bread, but I'm going to go on tempting you. He says, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. They go up to the pinnacle, the high, one of the high points in the temple. And for it is, he says, And cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in, thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Notice Satan probably knows a lot more scripture. No, Satan definitely knows a lot more scripture than you do. That's why we need right. to be in the Bible. We need to be learning what Jesus truly said. Because Satan can take something out of context and twist it and make us think we need to do something right. that we don't actually need to do. But he has this great idea here. He's going to tempt the Lord. He says, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. So what if we could have Jesus come? We all go up on Mount Pleasant. And we say, you know what? We get the whole town together, everyone gathered up together. And Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to jump off the pinnacle, or off the, um, the top of Mount Pleasant. And when he jumps down, if he truly is the Son of God, the angels are going to come and save him. They're going to come to catch him. The whole town would believe in God, right? Well, Hebrews says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right. We don't need to get a big show together, get everybody together. We don't need the entertainment. Right. You know, when we entertain everybody, we can get everyone together, give them a good show. Brother Rogers, honestly, he's going to sing wonderful. He's got a good sense of humor when he preaches. But the reason we have him in is because he preaches the word. Again, Jesus says, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He said, you know what? Not providing for the physical needs, that's not the main focus. And not gathering together everybody and putting on a show to show them who Jesus is. That's not the main thing. Jesus said, by, or Paul said, by the foolishness of preaching, men are saved. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, I am not opposed to there being Christian TV shows, because you can't even watch regular TV anymore. It's all horrible. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying when Brother Rogers says something funny that we shouldn't laugh and we need to be just focused on God's word. We need to focus on God's word, and if it makes us laugh, that's okay. But we're not having him in just to hear good music. We're not having right. him in just to sing and put on a, have, a, have a good sermon. We need God's word. But Jesus says again, uh, so Jesus said to him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. There is quoted Deuteronomy 6, 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as he tempted him in Massa. The children of Israel had tempted him in Massa. They were punished. It did not go well. But Jesus says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know, God can work just as strong and mightily for each and every one of us taking the track, inviting someone, bringing them to here next week. If we can, if God can work just as mightily as us sharing through our, God can work just as mightily through us sharing our testimonies one-on-one. -on -one. As he could if we could get everyone in Lancaster right. gathered together. God is not limited. He says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Just because we get the whole city together doesn't mean God has to work more powerfully than if we just go out and faithfully tell one person each day. Whoever God puts on our heart to tell, when we go out of our way to tell them, Jesus Christ, God can bless just as much as if we could put on a big show and get everyone to gather together. It's not the physical needs, it's not entertainment. While these things aren't bad, these are not going to bring revival. Not physical needs, providing for them, and that's good when you provide for physical needs. It's not wrong to be entertained, but if it's not the word of God, it's not going to bring revival. Amen. Verse 8 says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, Jesus Christ, he didn't need all the kingdoms of the world. He, Satan says, if you come up and you fall down and worship before me, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. How he does that, we don't know. Satan has more power than you and I will ever have. But God has more power than Satan. But he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. First Corinthians says that Satan is the god of this world, the lowercase g. When a man sinned, Satan took dominion of the world. Satan can do things on earth that we can't imagine. He's behind all the evil forces, each of these things. He's not the one that makes us sin, but Satan, we can see it clearly, is running the world today, it seems like. But he says, I will give thee all the kingdoms of the world. Now, God's still in control, but Satan has free reign to tempt people in the world today. And he says, I will give thee all the kingdoms of the world. So Jesus Christ here, if he would have bowed down and worshipped Satan even just a minute, he could have had all the kingdoms of the world. But if he would have got all the kingdoms of the world from Satan, he still wouldn't have saved the whole world. 
We still need to go to the cross. We still need to die. We still each individually need to place our faith in his finished works, his death, his burial, his resurrection. You know what? It's not going to be politics that saves us. It's not going to be our physical needs. It's not going to be entertainment that reaches the town. And it's not going to be politics. If we could get every politician running in the next election and then in November, we could get each and every one of them saved. It would probably help, but it wouldn't save our nation. Because then there would be another election and we could just get corrupt again. And I thank God for our government. I thank God for the ability to vote, the privilege to vote. But focusing on politics is not going to be what gets us to reach others. I had a preacher text me the other day. He said, hey, we're going to interview this senator if you want to come. It's in Columbus. I didn't go. That's good. It's good to know who our senators are. It's good if you... I've kicked myself all year, okay? The Lancaster Festival, the Art Walk, it was this year or last year. But the mayor walked by me, or maybe here it was there or where I was. But I saw him somewhere, and I went to talk to him, and I got nervous and backed off. It was Mayor Scheffler, I think there's another mayor now. But Mayor Scheffler, I, I backed off. Now, if you see the mayor, if you see a politician, we need to still witness to them. I'm not saying ignore them. But focusing so much on politics is not going to save our world. Right. And individuals and the politics getting saved, that's important. <laughs> But focusing on politicians, po- focusing on politics, who we get in office, that's not going to save all. It's going to be God's word. Jesus says, get thee hence, right. Satan, for it is written, again, he quotes God's word, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So this week, how are we going to have revival? It's not going to be providing for everyone's physical needs. It's not going to be focusing so much on entertainment or politics. But what did Jesus do during this time? Look down to verse 1. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward in hunger. But notice he fasted forty days and forty nights. Jesus was spending time in prayer. I heard, I think it was Ian Bounds said in his book, he said, prayer is hard work. I know, honestly... Praying, we have, pastor has a prayer list with everyone's name on it. When I try to sit down and pray for this 17-page prayer list, I get more distracted when I'm looking at that prayer list than all the rest of the week. Right. Mm-hmm. Prayer is hard work. It may not seem hard, it's just talking to God, and that's true. It's just talking to our Father. But Satan will fight us so hard when we pray. But if we pray seriously, God will do something. James 4, 1 and 2 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that mourn your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. If we want God to really work this week, even before Brother Rogers gets here, we need to pray seriously. How to pray, let's pray for one another. I heard someone say, you have a contacts list on your phone, that is a really good prayer list. If you have a cell phone and you have a bunch of people's numbers, and you have their names saved on there, just go through and start praying for all those people. Pray seriously. If you have someone lost in your contacts, pray for them to be saved. Send them a text, hey, we're having a service this week. Send them a picture of a track with the plan of salvation. We get the gospel as we need to pray seriously. Ask and it shall be given you. Matthew 7, 7, 8 says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If we want to see some mighty moving of the God, another great awakening, another revival, or just even God working in our hearts, we need to pray seriously. Right. Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, Call unto me, and I will answer the issue. He just got alone with God, and we prayed seriously. It goes on, in verse 4 it says, But he answered and said, It is written. Verse 7 says, Jesus said unto him, It is written. And verse 10 says, Then Jesus said unto him, Give me a head Satan, for it is written. And he goes back to the Old Testament. Each of these quotes are from Deuteronomy. And he goes to Deuteronomy and quotes the Old Testament scripture. We need to pray seriously, and then we need to ponder scriptures. We need to ponder the scriptures. Not just read it in the morning and go on in our day, but whatever we read that morning, ask God, please give me something through this reading right now. Whether you read a chapter, whether you read ten chapters, whatever you read, ask God to speak to you through something that you can think about all day long. If you're reading in Acts, you see how they go out witnessing. Maybe, God, please put something on my heart today that I can witness to. And you see Peter and John, they're thrown in jail, they're punished. Um, James is eventually martyred. But through all the trials, they go out witnessing. And maybe if you're reading in Acts that day, Lord, help me to be a witness as these are. Amen. David, we see in the Psalms, when he's going through a hard time, he just takes it to God in prayer. Lord, whatever happens today that stresses me out, that 
and gives me a problem and tries to get my eyes off of you. Help me to take it to you like David. Ponder the scripture. Psalm 1, 1 to 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If we want to have a fruitful life and that our fruit should remain, delight in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night, focus on the Bible, focus on it day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season will be fruitful. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I know we talked about it in teens. I'm not sure if you guys talked about it in adults this morning. But God's will know to be fruitful and multiply. When we look through that passage, we can see ways that we can have fruit in our lives. It's only by God's grace. Anything we do must be God's way. And each of these things, God's will know to do. If we do it God's way, we can have fruitful lives. So if we get in God's word, we pray seriously. We ponder the scriptures. God promised, he said, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not hither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be, just as rain or snow comes down and waters everything, so shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth, and shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I send it. If we focus on God's word tonight, it's not going to return void. If we wake up in the morning or sometime throughout the day, we spend time in God's word, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday night, get in church, here, God's word, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're praying. And Sunday, we come with our hearts ready, pondering scripture. God's word will not return to him void. Right. If we pray seriously, focus on the scripture, God's word will never return void. I know pastors told a story. I want to say it was Herb Smith. I don't think it was. Someone, he gave a track to, and they crumbled it up and threw it down. And another guy saw them throw something down. He came up, picked it up, and crumbled it, read it, and he got saved then, right? He was in church the next morning. He had been saved. He was out of church. Someone took a track, threw it down, crumbled it up, stepped on it. But God still used that in someone else's life. His word did not return void. Hebrews 4 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. You say, I cannot reach this person. Well, God's word can. We pray seriously. Yeah, right. There's someone in our lives that we want to see saved. Invite them. Maybe if they're far away in another state or something, someone you can't reach, maybe have them somehow watch the live stream. Be praying. God will have a way to reach them. Pray seriously. Ponder the scriptures. And then he goes on. We finish verse 11. It says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast in prison, John the Baptist, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Nephilim, and that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, In the land of Zebulun and in the land of Nephilim, by the way of the seas beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He prayed seriously. Amen. He pondered the scriptures, he focused on the scriptures all day long, and then he goes to these different towns, and he begins to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He preached salvation. Now, we may not all have the opportunity to get up here and share God's word to the church and gather together, but we can go out and we can share our testimonies. Philip, when he started following Jesus, he went to Nathaniel and said, Come see a man. We found the Messiah. Come and see. Amen. When the woman at the well, when she got saved, she ran into town and says, Come and see a man that told me all things that I've ever done. And just their testimonies got people interested and they came to church. When we bring God's word to someone else, whether it's just sharing our testimony, you say, I don't know the scriptures, we'll grab a track, look at it all week long, memorize the scriptures. If you need help, come ask me, I'll show you what verses in the Bible and in the Bible to highlight and stuff. But if we will get God's word in our heart, and then if we'll just go even to share our testimony, you say, I don't know if I can quote scripture, I don't know if I can do these things. God will bring scripture to your mind. If you're in the word and you go to witness someone, he will bring scripture to your mind. It's miraculous. Stuff you didn't even ever think you studied, you never looked at, you looked at it maybe, but you didn't think you ever learned it. God will bring it up. But if we just go share our testimonies and come and see, come and see. We go out this week, our co-workers, hey, I just want to tell you how Jesus Christ changed my life and tell them how you got saved and how you're following God and how he's blessed you. And you're at peace more than ever before. Whatever you tell them that God's done in your life, you tell them and you say, you know what, we're having this preacher come Sunday. Now, give them the gospel, then, if God opens the door. 
Let's say we're having this preacher come Sunday, and we'd love to, for you to come and see this man. They preach salvation. Amen. Jesus, when he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 1 Corinthians 1, 21-24 says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God, that by the, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified Amen. unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both the Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul told Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall preach the, you shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be it in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and sore with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. In Luke 24, 46, and 47, one of the great commission passages it says, And Jesus and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooves Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. This is why Jesus died and was buried and rose again. And that repentance, forgiveness, and remission of sins, repentance, turning from sin, and remission, forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We pray, God, give me someone to witness to this week. And we go out and we preach, if you turn from your sins, repentance, Christ will forgive you remission. And if you place your faith in him, he will save you from your sins. Amen. You know what? That'll do more than meeting every physical need in the town will do. That'll do more than getting the whole town together Amen. and putting on a great show. That'll do more than getting all the right politicians elected. If we'll give the word. Pray right. seriously. Pray without ceasing, it says. Um, whatever we ask in his name, he'll give it to us. Pray seriously. Ponder the scriptures. Be in God's word constantly this week. And then preach salvation. Share what you learn in the Bible this week. Share what God's doing in your life. Your salvation testimony. Share it with someone else. And let's see what God can do in our lives this week. Mm-hmm. Even before Brother Rogers gets here. He says, you, ask not, you have not because you ask not. Ask and it shall be given. And remember... You say, Micah, I don't know if he could do that. I've never seen him do it before in my life. Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I'm sure hoping for it. The evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders were to obtain a good report. By it, we understand that the worlds were formed through creation. Um, faith. If we have faith, he says, whatsoever we ask in his name, believe it. We shall receive it. So if we pray scripture, or we pray seriously, ponder the scriptures, and preach salvation. God can do wonderful, mighty things in his will more than we could ever imagine. He says he can do exceeding abundantly above anything we could ever Amen. think or ask. It's in Ephesians, I believe, chapter 4. So if we get on our knees this week and pray seriously, ponder scriptures, and then preach salvation to our co-workers or any people who need our family, we can see God do wonderful things. Amen. More than any politics or entertainment or physical means will ever um, do. If we'll just get God's word out and pray seriously and get to know our Heavenly Father better. As our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, we all stand. If you're not saved tonight, my word, that's the most important thing you can do. The wages of sin is death. Those things that you've done contrary to the Bible, those things you've done that have been against God, we will all sin, all sin and control the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire, and this is the second death. If you're not saved, one day you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He died on the cross, was buried, and rose again, so that you can go to heaven if you place your faith in him. Whatever the need is tonight, bring it to him. He can save you, Christian. He can do wonderful things in your life. If we'll just let him. It only takes the faith of a Muslim.